Welcome to Billy Noel's Desert Island Tims in association with the Emerald Isle, the Gallagate's number one Irish pub. My guest today has been involved in representing Celtic supporters for many, many years now. He is now involved with Fans Against Criminalisation. Eddie Toner, how are you, sir? I'm fantastic, Billy. Uh, much better for unravelling the mystery that is Billy Noel and getting to meet a great man. So, yeah, doing very well. Well, thank you very much. So, what was life like for you growing up? Yeah, hey, life for me growing up, Billy, was was pretty good, I have to say. I, I grew up in the sprawling housing estate that is Easter House in Glasgow's East End. Uh, very happy upbringing. Lived up there with my mother, my father, one of four kids. I had an older sister, Marie. There was myself, my younger brother, Shuggy, or for folk that's listening to this, Sinn Féin Shuggy, as he was affectionately known by, by the teachers at St Leonard School for some time, and my younger sister, Eileen. Life was tough in Easter House, uh, like it was probably in many other house in the States around about uh, Glasgow at the time. But it was happy, you know, we, we were a happy family. Four years living there together in a in a wee two bedroom flat you know and never knew my man daddy of a bedroom he was about 19 and we moved to Denison so they lived in the old pull down bed in the couch in the living room uh, me and my brother shared the room two sisters shared the room had a great upbringing schooling was great in Easterhouse went to St Benedict's school uh, primary school up there followed on to St Leonard's secondary that gave us a good grounding for life I think the Easterhouse was great it's like quite simple in the days because it was it was a place where basically you went to school you came in for school you went out and played football there was tons of football parts in Easterhouse there was tons of open spaces and everybody was in the same boat none of us had much but yeah, we all seemed relatively happy if I was to choose my childhood again I don't think I would have there would be anything I would choose any differently about it I was you know perfectly happy growing up despite us all being cramped in a wee house but we moved down to Denison when I was when I was 18 into this house upstairs and downstairs and two <laughs> toilets and <laughs> uh, and my man and I eventually go to a room and three bedrooms and, and that was good as well but you know that took me off into, into adulthood and it was near the tune as well which was great at 18 you know when you moved down there and you're starting to venture out up with dancing and stuff like that you'd no fatty stagger him so <laughs> no complaints at all about my childhood I have to say was very happy excellent so your first song what would that be and why did you pick it my first song really takes me back to my childhood we were a family who all like partying together we came, I came from a very big family my, my father was one of ten my mum was one of six and also was one of an extended family like my ma's auntie and uncle had 16 wains and we were all very close and more so probably in the Doherty side and we were on the Toner side my ma was a Doherty and we were off of Shettleson and we used to all get together and there was always some great family parties and you know there was always the inevitable sing song and quite often the songs you know would start off relatively tame but that gave me a grounding for later on for well, that's where I probably started to learn my first rebel songs if you like because we used to get you know the wearing of the green and Irish soldier laddie and Sean South of Gary Owen and Hail Glory St. Pat they, they were the tunes but I'm not starting off in that vein, I'm starting off with some songs that remember me in my childhood and anybody that's ever been to a tone or sort of a Doherty party will know this song very well. My dad incidentally was a cracking singer and was a big Mark Monroe fan and uh, you know loved singing Mark Monroe, Perry Como type songs but my ma always sang this this particular song and she still does to this day, my ma's 78 now and, and, and a season ticket holder still at Selig Park sits beside me in the main stand and, and this is her party piece so it just reminds me of my childhood but it also reminds me of the new year just passed when she was up in the house as well and it's just one of these songs that, that's my ma's song and it's uh, Blueberry Hill by Fats Domino uh, Found my thrill on blueberry hill on blueberry hill when I found you the moon stood still on blueberry hill. But all of the vows you made were never to be So we're a point You thought of me 
myself Oh, you want my thrill On Blueberry Hill The wind in the willow play Love's sweet melody But all of the vibes was Blueberry Hill by Fats Domino. Right, Eddie, can you tell us a bit more about what you do? Sort of a professionally, what I do now is, is I drive a black taxi for my sins around about Glasgow. I've finally succumbed and joined the petty bourgeoisie and become a self-employed taxi driver. I mean, I left school at 16 and uh, worked in various jobs, but mostly in the public sector. I mean, I worked for a long, long time in the civil service, Her Majesty's civil service. Worked in the social security offices in Steps Road and in the city centre in the town. Uh, but eventually became sort of a gamekeeper turned poacher. Uh, went over to the, the other side, the real side, and, and became a claimant's representative. And I worked in sort of welfare rights for a number of years. Started off in that line working in a, in a community-based advice project in High Kill in the East End. Uh, basically advising people on their benefits and their debt problems and representing people at, you know, social security appeal tribunals and stuff like that. Left High Hill, went on to work in Shettleson. Yeah, so I've never really ventured far out the East End of Glasgow. I mean, I've lived there all my life and effectively worked there all my life and I don't really see myself going anywhere else now. But worked in Shettleson in the Housing Association there as a welfare rights officer there uh, for, for a number of years as well and eventually left there. I had some health problems that meant I wasn't at work as quite as often as I should have been for uh, maybe about seven, seven, eight years ago. I was struggling a wee bit to keep the job going and the association herself needed to keep the, the service going. And so I was eventually sort of offered a, a package to leave there and, and took that and found myself in a position when for the first time ever that I was I was out of work uh, and I was only sick for about six, seven months uh, and wasn't sure where I was going to go and sort of I stumbled into the taxi game to be honest because I had a couple of mates who drove taxis and I was saying, oh, you know, the money's no bad, you should try it and, and I eventually did, I went and sat the knowledge of the test for the Glasgow taxis and got my taxi badge and worked for a couple of years driving for a guy so I was feeling my way around about the job and sort of eventually four years ago made the decision to to sort of invest in uh, buying a taxi, uh, buying a plate in the car, and sort of effectively buying the business. So I done that four years ago, and, and I'm still doing it yet. And uh, my timing was impeccable, like anything I've done. And you know, uh, I was the type of guy who bought into the taxi business just when he asked for it. You know, <laughs> but yeah, I quite enjoy it. You know, it's, it's different for anything I've ever done before. Quite long hours, you know. But you, you, in some ways, you're the sort of a master of your own destiny in terms of the hours that you work and when you work, and you don't need to apply for time off. And that's much easier if you're going to see the scenery like, and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, you can sort of. A, take days off here and days off here as it pleases you and so I like I like the flexibility and the freedom it offers you I like meeting people I like talking about Glasgow I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proud Glaswegian and you know I like showing the city after tourists and stuff like that so I, I, I quite enjoy it so that's a sort of a summary where I am professionally but more importantly you know w- w- things I'm involved in at the moment and, and it also seems to be things that I've been involved in all my days is on the Celtic side of things I mean I've, I've effectively been involved in Celtic supporters organisations since it feels as if since I was born you know, mm-hmm. I've been a member of the Supporters Association since I was 16. Member of the Denison Number One Supporters Club. I joined that when I was 18 when I moved to Denison. I'm still a member of that. I ran the club for the best part of 20 odd years. Was involved in the Supporters Association. Was the General Secretary Association for for seven years, and that was very interesting. There was lots of interesting things happened in my time as a, as a secretary of the association and at that time the association were probably encroaching you know upwards of seven eight thousand members you know they were a big organization with maybe 300 supporters clubs all around the world and it was quite a daunting task you know doing that in a voluntary basis whilst holding doing a job and, and also at that time I had two young kids my two boys who are up now they're 20 and 18 now but uh, it took up a lot of my time eventually I'd stepped back for the association certainly in a committee sense about six seven years ago 
but was involved in a lot of campaigns during that time you know one of the proudest moments for me uh, during that phase was being asked to go out to FIFA headquarters and receive the fair play trophy for the Celtic fans after they were awarded at Fallen Seville run in 1983 that was an incredible time for me you know I flew out there for three days with Peter Lowell you know it was basically the World Player Awards and you turned up at this award ceremony you know and it was just full of you know celebrities and a who's who the football world yeah. you know Started off in the first night sitting having brandies with guys like Seth Blatter and the head of the Brazilian FA and the head of the German FA and it's a bit disconcerting as well when you see the amount of cash it was spent on these things and the level of sort of a cow town to people yeah. like Blatter and stuff like that and, and they were all sitting there drinking brandy out of bowls I could have had a bath in you know and uh, <laughs> and smoking the biggest cigars and you know and you know it was a bit obscene in that regard but it was proud for me in the fact that I knew I was there representing something that we as Celtic supporters had achieved Mm. and it was recognised worldwide but I mean if you indulge me there's a couple of funny stories about that that I could tell you know I mean, one of the first things is we flew from Glasgow to London and then we're flown for London first class with Swiss Air on to Basel in Switzerland Uh, the flight out the baggage handlers at Heathrow somehow contrived to lose my suit I turned up in uh, Basel in Switzerland you know chauffeur driven picked up uh, you know at the airport myself and Peter Lowell when we were taken to this big fancy five star hotel and all I had was the clothes I was standing in uh, when I arrived there I was assured that that wasn't going to be a problem the ceremony itself wasn't the next day and I was told they would get the suit and fly out for me for the next day so so I was left that night in a pair of jeans and in the shirt that I travelled in and got to meet, as I say, all these, all these celebrities and stuff like that who were all suited and booted. I mean, that, that in itself didn't bother me, but I was a wee bit uncomfortable about what was going to happen the next day. Anyway, I guess up the next day, still in a suit. And I was talking to the guy, I think at the time was David Will, who was a Scottish sort of a representative in FIFA at the time, and explaining the story to him. And he says, Oh, we'll sort something out for you. And before I knew it, this guy came over and introduced himself as my driver, and he was going to take me downtown to buy a suit. So I was driven downtown to, in downtown Basel, and this guy was taking me in all these shops, you know, pick a suit, you know, but he was taking me in all these designer shops that had sort of a Hugo Boss suit. That, four and five grand and all these fancy then I'm looking at myself saying who's paying for this you know <laughs> and and when eventually I asked the guy she says oh I have been instructed to buy you whatever you need you know so I'm looking and thinking no I can't buy a suit <laughs> I just couldn't justify that level of expense if you like for, for one set I mean, but anyway started trying suits on and me being a rather portly figure you know it was really difficult to get a off the peg suit at such short notice uh, and eventually got this suit and the guy saying I can adjust that for you no problem you know and I bet him, but it was a crazy sum of money you know and uh, he then explained to me that they wouldn't be able to do the alterations straight away but this is an hour or two before right. we're supposed to go to this ceremony and I'd need to come back later that afternoon so it turned out it wasn't looking likely I was going to get a suit uh, I decided that well, I'm a fans representative, I'm here representing the punters, so I'll just go to the ceremony, dress like a punter, and I'll just go as I was. And I duly did, and to be honest, I got a bit of a kicking after it, on the, the chat rooms, if you like, for the Celtic supporters, you know, turning up representing us like a tramp, you know, and, and that's how these things develop, you know, so people without realising the full story immediately jump in and they're just willing to get a bit of, there was other people saying, no, I turned up there like a supporter, and... Uh, mm-hmm. And there was near a problem with it. But this, you know, there was a debate ensued for about three or four days on the internet because I turned up there through no fault of my own, and, you know, dressed in the same clay. I was starting to smell a bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and had to go after that ceremony to a match that night as well. It was a Ronaldo select against us, a Dan select. Uh, and all the top players that was in the world were playing in. And it was for UNICEF, I think, that uh, we were being wind and dined with all the foot, and I'm still sticking the with the same clay zone. But I didn't have much choice. <laughs> But an even funnier story for that trip, and I'm sure that's one the listeners might enjoy, was when I turned up at the ceremony, the guy was looking at me, you know, I had my accreditation, but he was clearly looking at the way I was dressed, and I had to convince him that I was, you know, Mr Toner for the Celtic Supporters Association. After about a sort of a debate, you know, he agreed to let me in, and Peter Lowell, because he wasn't receiving the award, was sitting further back, I was, as a recipient, was sitting in the front row, and the guy says to me, if you go to the front, you'll find that your name is on the seat. And I, again, you know, tend to take these things in my stride And he says, you just sit there and somebody will come over and explain So anyway, goes down and here's this row of seats at the front And the names were Henri, Ronaldo, Zidane, Toner <laughs> And Lundberg was the seat next to me So I'm thinking, oh, 
pretty exalted company here, Eddie boy, you know, so, you know, in troops, Zinedine Zidane and Ronaldo, the Brazilian Ronaldo, no Cristiano, the Brazilian Ronaldo, and I could see them sort of looking at me and sitting there with the same shirt and the like on, you know. <laughs> but anyway, again, you know, I've never faced with celebrity, I have to say, so that wasn't bothering me, you know, but... Uh, but this woman came in and sat in the seat next to me and me being me and having to get involved sort of I thought she was in the wrong seat and says to her excuse me I think you're in the wrong seat and she looked at me and she says oh, I don't understand so I asked her to stand up and pointed out that the seat was Lundberg I says that's for Freddie Lundberg and she laughed and says my name is Hannah Lundberg <laughs> she says and I'm a nominee for the best female footballer in the world <laughs> And I says, well, I beg your pardon, good luck with the nomination, <laughs> yeah, I but uh, here was me thinking it was for Freddie Lundberg, and I was telling this woman she'd need to move, it turns out she didn't win the award, I think the award went to a German woman, but uh, rather than a Swede, but I was, I was suitably <laughs> embarrassed and very apologetic, but... But it, you know that was you know that was great some sort of great stories of my time and over even just that couple of days there was lots of other things involved in you know what again one of one of the things I'm really proud about is is the, I chaired the committee that did all the fundraising for the the Brother Wolford statue at Celtic Park and it was one of the first times where we were able to get all the supporters groups to pull together and work together and to, to a common purpose you know right. sometimes you get involved in these things in the politics other people are pursuing their own agendas and that always annoyed me I, I was always a big and still am uh, of the belief that if you could unite the Celtic supporters we would be a formidable force and sometimes we're often fragmented and there, sometimes I think there are too many groups pursuing different interests and, and different agendas And but doing a bit of Wolford Statue is the one time where we did all work together the representatives for the association and the affiliation and the trust and you know all the different groups were involved in it and very early on in that, I mean, the idea for us with the Walford thing was is that we wanted to put up a memorial outside Parkhead that would serve as a permanent reminder to people about exactly who Celtic were, mm. what we were all about, where we come from. And something that, you know, anybody walking in that front door would have a look at and say, you know, that's who we are and that's what we're all about. And that, for us, was the purpose of getting together and, and embarking down the road, you know, a statue. There was a lot of discussion about should we have statues of the Celtic greats first, or, you know, and, and for me that just was a non-argument. For me it could only be Walford. And in some ways, and you know, and I know that's maybe a bit controversial and some people will not agree with me, which, which is fine, but I don't think there should be any other statues at the front door at Celtic Park, other than the brother Walford. I'm quite happy that statues of Jock Steen and me, Jimmy, and, and, and others that they come along were placed along, along the ground, but I think it takes away a wee bit for the Walford story having it surrounded you know yeah. you know if you put any mare up there it's going to look like the Coliseum you know yeah. but uh, I think you know maybe you know we were this new Celtic walkway and all this stuff maybe the statue should have been in different places but know that they get you know like B. Jimmy and Big Jock were yeah, they, you know one of the great Celts or great servants to the club or anything like that but I just felt that Walford himself should stand out like a beacon not only is a reminder of to us, see where we come from, but as a reminder for future generations. But, mm -hmm. but anyway, the statues there, and very early on in the campaign, there was a couple of prominent businessmen, if you like, come to us and says, "What's it going to cost? We'll put, we'll throw the money, and we'll get it up." And, and we didn't want that either. Uh, what we wanted was to raise the money. We wanted the Celtic supporters to raise the money again. Part of an educational process, if you like, it was you know if one guy was throwing a pound in a bucket for that statue. He was thinking about why he was putting a pound in a bucket. And the statue eventually cost us, I think, somewhere in the region of about sixty, sixty-five thousand pound, and it took us about three years to raise the money mm -hmm. through different fundraisers, supporters, clubs were chipping in. We organised a few big dues at Celtic Park to raise funds. We had a bucket collection. We did that, but, but it was important for us that every Celtic supporter get the opportunity to donate to it rather than somebody signing off a check for it. We could have put it up in a week, right. but it took us three years. But the fans paid for it. And it's there, and you know, I remember the day the unveiling of it. Thousands turned up at Celtic Park for the unveiling, and made a big fancy ceremony and stuff like that. And you know, and that was a really proud moment for me as well. And it's something I can look back at and say, well, you know, that's something that you know I was involved in, and it helped the Celtic supporters to achieve and things like that. I've always been in, you know, run about Celtic. I've always been involved in projects that, for me, are important because yeah. for me, Celtic are about the supporters. Uh -huh. You know, you know, the players come, players go. Chief execs come, chief ex board members come, you know, but but the fans are the only constant at the club. Yeah. And we are what defines Celtic for me. It's the community for me. That's what draws me to Celtic every week. Mm -hmm. I don't go to Celtic in an expectation that we're going to win. Yeah. 
And in some ways, for me, that's not the most important thing. And, and, and I know it is for some, and I'm quite, you know, if people attach yourself to the club because they just see it as a release, and, you know, a sporting release, and they just, you know, and they want success, and that's good. Mm-hmm. But it was never about that for me. For me, Celtic are about the community uh-huh. and the people that follow them, and, the, you know, my family and your family and all the other Celtic families that all come together and, mm-hmm. you know, as a community. And for me, that's really what defines Celtic, and that's what will always define Celtic for me. So I used to say to boys in the bus when they got upset after we'd lost big games, and, I, you know, we didn't win the day, but for me, the victory for, for us as Celtic supporters was, you know, looking around the stadium, watching the crowds that were there. And, when they, you know, when that team ran onto the park every week, that was a victory for me because there was so many obstacles put in the way of Celtic and Celtic success, and we overcome that time after time after time. And that in itself is a victory for me. And being part of that community is what makes Celtic special. So, I suppose on a personal point, that, that's really what defines me. People probably know me first and foremost as Eddie Toner, a Celtic fan, rather than Eddie Toner, the taxi driver, or a welfare rights officer, or yeah, whatever yeah. I've done in, in a professional capacity. So, I probably always will be associated with Celtic in that regard. You know, nothing I'm ashamed of, I'm actually something I'm quite proud of. So. Your second song, what would that be? My second song. And again, it takes me back to to my early days up in Easterhouse. I mean, I, I was never a big out there music fan. You know, when I grew up, it was, you know, as I said earlier, it was all about supporting Sally, and I was just immersed in football. So my music was probably defined by Top of the Pops. And, you know, I was, I was you know, I influenced me what was on Top of the Pops at the time. And, and I've liked the song. Some of my musical tastes all over the place, as you'll probably realise when we get to the end of this. You know, there's no, there's no a constant in it. And, you know, if I liked a song, I liked a song. And been Top of the Pops when I was growing up was a big thing. We all sat and we watched Top of the Pops, and I, you know, on a Thursday night when it came on, and we listened to the charts, we were all re- tape recorders, so <laughs> they tape the charts and stuff like that, and played that back all weekend. So I was a big Slade fan in the days. I loved all the stuff that Slade done, you know, for you know, Mama we were all crazy now, he come and feel the noise and stuff like that. So I probably couldn't have done a session like this without mentioning Slade, but this particular song, I think personally for me, was a Slade's best song. I don't think it ever reached number one actually, uh, but uh, for me it was. Uh, it's just a song I always reflect back to in my, my very young days in Easter House and my Top of the Pops days. And we bought, I remember buying a few different Slade albums and stuff like that. And, and this was one I used to play all the time. So it's uh, Far, Far Away by Slade. I've seen the yellow lights go down the Mississippi. I've seen the bridges of the world and they're for real. I've had a red light off the wrist without me even getting kissed. It still seems so unreal. I've seen the morning in the mountains of Alaska I've seen the sunset in the east and in the west I've sang the glory that was Rome And passed the hound up to see home It still seems 
was Far Far Away by Slade. Who were your heroes and influences? I've been thinking about this question the last few, you know, the last week or so. And uh, in terms of influences, like probably a few of your other guests, I mean, the obvious ones are their political influences. Uh, you know, people like Mandela. For anybody growing up when I did, you couldn't help being influenced with people like Bobby Sands and the Hunger Strikers and the sacrifices that people like that made. Yeah. Uh, in a political sense, people like Tony Benn influenced me, Dennis Skinner, you know, traditional Labour Party people, you know, for the, throughout the 70s and 80s. Uh, ultimately, I think the biggest influences in me have been my family. I come from a very big family, but, but although we're a big family, we're not a far fung family, we were all. None of us have ventured far out the East End. And my, my father was a big influence in me uh, growing up. My dad, like probably many, many of that generation, was a hard working guy. He worked in the building game all his days and. He liked his paint, he liked his punt, he was a bit of a punter. Uh, you know, he, he probably worked hard and played hard and loved going to see the Celtic and stuff like that. And, 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 and you know, he was a big influence in my life. Sadly, I lost my dad in 1998. He died of yeah, lung cancer when he was only 63. And I still miss him. Uh, my dad was, my dad became probably merry a mate than a father. You know, we used to go for a pint together and went to the odd game together and stuff like that and so he was a big influence in the family you know and, and his loss was a terrible loss uh, but probably my mother was more of an influence my ma kept the family going you know my ma despite my ma also worked my ma had a part time job and she probably needed to work she didn't like it most days none of us worked because we love it we all work out of necessity so my ma kept the, you know the house going and, and, and the family going while my dad was working and quite often you know there were times when my dad would be working maybe away from home and stuff like that and the money would come back and my ma probably got her set wages and my dad is few bob for his punting and his painting and my ma just got on with things make things happen and but even for a Celtic supporting sense my ma was a big influence in me my grandfather my mum's dad was a groundsman at Celtic Park for the best part of 30 years mm -hmm. so we were always doing when about the park we all hung about there when we were kids and uh, you know, and that was a time in the sixties. You know, in the seventies, when you know Jock Steen was around, and Jock, Jock Steen was a great pal. My, my granddad's and used to come and visit us. And my granny and grand eventually moved into the flats at Park Eden. Big Jock would quite often drive in for a cup of tea and stuff like that. Yeah. And it was just incredible. You know, instead of thinking back on it, but uh, but the Celtic thing was really. We were steeped in Celtic because I think Mary, my mad's influence. I could have went to my dad went to all the games as well. I could have went with my dad to matches. I went with my dad with matches at Men's Stone and outside the pub in Shettleson <laughs> to like, you know, 10 to 3. And then having to run like, you know, Jesus down the, down the road to make sure you go there for the kick off. But you were left stunned outside with your bottle of coke and your packet of plain crisps. The other side of that was I could have went with my ma, mama and all our a sister and, and, and all my aunties and that all worked in the pie stalls right. at the game so they were always doing early getting the stalls set up and that so I kind of went with my man it meant you get in for nothing well you get in for nothing anyway if you went with your dad because you got a lift there but uh, I went down with my ma because you went down early and you get in and you get a seat in the main stand and uh, quite often you would, would have been the first person sitting in the stadium you know and you could see the stadium building up and and I heart back to the big European nights and stuff like that. It was just amazing as a wee boy, you know, going to, like, you know, the Inter Milan game, you know, when, when me Dixie put a boy out of the bar in it, you know, Fiorentina, Juppes Doza, you know, oh, oh, Basel, all oh, oh, of the games. Big, big nights at Celtic Park, being in there right at the start and watching the ground and, you know, listening to the atmosphere build up and stuff like that. And, you know, I was hooked then for that, so... Right. So in a Celtic supporting sense, my ma was a, was a big influence. I remember a great story as well, he got into the Leeds United European Cup semi-final and again I had the choice of going with my dad on the bus for, what was it, I think McMullins and Shittleson or the town tavern as it's known, or going with my ma and my granny got dressed her and my auntie Mary got dressed her. Yeah. And they had tickets for a big North Stand. I hammed in the old North Stand or I could went with my dad into the cell end or so. And even at seven years of age, it was quite wise, you know. <laughs> so I think I'll go with my man, my granny, and my Mary, you know. So we went to Hamden and, and I'll never forget that night being in the North Stand and looking down just at the sheer volume of the crowd. And, and the game itself was obviously incredible. I don't remember much about the actual football that was played, but, you know, I was aware that Celtic had won, you know, and I knew that was us in the final European Cup again. And, and it was just incredible. But we get lost coming out. I remember my dad saying, when you come out, you know, turn left and keep walking and that'll bring you into the town. My plan was to walk to the town and get a train back to Easterhouse. 
but we for some reason turned right and ended up in Castle Milk, you know. <laughs> so when we get lost, that was my biggest memory of that night. You know, it's like just won a European Cup and we were stoking about Castle Milk. You know. It was fair boy Feaster House was quite daunting, you know. We were, we were over there in enemy territory. <laughs> no apologies to any people out there. I'm sure the parrot will kill me for that. But, uh, but Castle Milk was a strange place for us in the day. <laughs> you know, it's probably the first time I'd ever been that far south. So, so my ma took me to all the big games. And my ma still goes to Celtic Park to this day. My ma's a season ticket holder at Celtic. Uh, she sits in the main stand in the same row as me and my sister and a couple of her pals. And so it's still a big family thing for us. So, But even just in a sense, you know, my ma family being important and keeping things going and how she looked after us all as kids and stuff like that, I would say my ma was probably a big influence in her personal capacity. In terms of heroes, again, and I get the obvious political heroes as I said earlier, but I worked in sort of a public service. Also, you know, as I made mention earlier, I worked in community based projects and I worked in housing associations and stuff like that. And for me, people I look back on in heroes are, are people that came from their communities, communities like Shettleson and like High Hill and, and, and places in the East End, with a number of people who came out as volunteers and, and worked. You know, these were people who had nothing in mm-hmm. tough estates and tough communities, but gave freely at their own time yeah. to try and make life better for others around about them. And the number of times they would be at meetings or they'd be out campaigning for this or campaigning for that. My time at High Hill, we were instrumental and in helped to set up with my colleague Alison. We were instrumental in setting up things like a credit union, furniture recycling project, a community cafe, getting funding for community halls and... Mm-hmm. And we did that as workers, we were paid workers and we helped to facilitate, you know, what was going on with the, the committees there, if you like. But the people who turned up in the committees and made a real difference mm-hmm. to the communities were heroes to me, if you like. There'll, there'll never be big names and they never did it for the, you know, the publicity or the glory. Or, but for me, they were real he- heroes. And there's probably countless people like that up and down the country. And real working class heroes, if you like. And I look back in A people, I'm not going to mention them because they would be embarrassed, I think, if it was to put their name out there publicly. But people like that were heroes to me rather than celebrity, yeah. if you like. And, 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 you know, and it probably still goes on to this day and, 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 and they make a real difference in our communities. And for that reason, they were my heroes. Fantastic. A third song, what would that be? My third song, and again, taking you back to my top of the pops days, and I could never do a thing like this without Rod the Mod. We were all big Rod Stewart fans in our house. When I've talked about my brother and my two sisters, and not so much my wee sister, because she was six years after I was born. But the, me and my sister and my brother, three years were born in less than three, a space of three years, you know. And So we were all grew up together, and we used to buy LPs and put their initials on them, Marie Eddie and Shug and stuff like that. And, and Rod Stewart, again, influenced... You know, was was always prominent. We were all big Rod Stewart fans, and and I loved the sort of rock and roll sound, you know, that sort of stuff for like Rod Stewart, and and always have done. So I, I couldn't do a session like this without again making some reference to Rod, and thought, you know, would it be reason to believe? Would it be, you know, something for the Atlantic Crossing? It was a bit more soppy album and stuff like. That. But I went for a. Uh, you wear it well because it's still a song I love, and I've got a wee drink that's sort of a belt and sort of a dancing in the living room. So Rod Stewart, you wear it well. Time that I don't mind 
What are your earliest memories of going to Celtic Park? To be perfectly honest, I can never remember no going about Celtic Park or no being about the park. I mean, you know, as I said, my, gra- my granddad at the time when I was born was a groundsman at Celtic Park and, and I just always seemed to be about the park. My ma would have taken me down there, you know, in my pram probably, down to see her dad, down to day. The family all worked around about the park. Uh, in various, you know, activities. They worked in the pie stalls. My granny was a cleaner. My granny used to polish the trophies, you know. She had the privilege of polishing the European Cup and stuff like that. And I myself was born in Belvedere Hospital, which, you know, is only a corner kick away from Selic Park in London Road. So I feel as if I was practically born in Selic Park, you know. And uh, I can't really remember a time when I've known been about the park. But in terms of going to a game... My young sister Ireland was born in 1969 and at the time, due to the overspill in the maternities and stuff like that, she was born in a place called Calder Bank House, I think it was, out in Bailiston. We stayed in Easterhouse at the time and my ma was in there. August 69 she was born and uh, I remember us being to visit my ma in the hospital, I think the morning of the game, and then we were taking the park with my dad in the afternoon. So around about the time she was born... August 1969, we all went along, and I, and I can remember, I, I'm pretty sure we were playing Wraith Rovers and won 5 or 6 nothing. So that would probably be my earliest memory of being at a game. You remember the big games, you know, I remember the, uh, you know, again, reference earlier, the European Cup semi-final Leeds and, you know, the great semi-final with Inter Milan and the semi-final with Atletico Madrid and brought up as a boy in eight times, you, just incredible, you know, you were getting to the last day, the last four or the final of the European Cup on a regular basis and, you know, anybody that didn't get hooked in Selig at that right. time, you know, there must have been something wrong with them. But uh, I've always been about the park. I mean, probably since I was about five year old, I could probably couldn't maybe miss less than 10, 20 games at Selig Park mm-hmm. in all the years. I just went all the time, every yeah. week. If there was a game on, you went to the match. Started going to away games when I was very, very young age as well, you know, and uh, went in the bus for Easterhouse. Uh, and then when we moved to Dennis and I joined the Celtic Supporters Club in Dennis but I, I spent most of my time sort of thinking I never really did anything even when I was a young adult I never really arranged anything without thinking well where's Celtic playing everything was all based on when about Aye. where the game was that weekend or is there a game during the week and I never made any arrangements like thousands of others I just never missed games uh, and I was lucky you know we coming for East End, Celtic Park was on my doorstep, you know, and I didn't need to make the sacrifices that some people do, you know, to get to see Celtic, but, uh, but I seriously can't remember a time when, when I didn't go to games. Uh, I mean, a wee bit of stushy at the moment, I've, I've, since Christmas I've decided I'm not travelling to any away games at the moment, because... You know, just through the way things are going at games at the moment, uh, I've lost a bit of the enjoyment here. Yeah, and a lot of it is down to the way that the police are sort of are carrying out, you know, their, their, their role and the powers that have been given through this Offensive Behaviour Act. And, 
you know, the amount of searching and, you know, surveillance and buses getting stopped and getting searched three and four times getting into games and, and when you get into the game, it's almost like a mil- military manoeuvre going to the football now and it's, uh, and I've decided myself that one of the things I'm going to do is stop going to away games now just to give myself a break for that and I'm no, I'm no advocating that people should be boycotting games. I think... Uh, you know, if we as all, all silly supporters were to stop doing that to an extent for a few weeks, the people who run the clubs around about the country, Aberdeen, Dundee United, St Mirren, Kilmarnock, wherever it might be, I think, you know, the guys that run the clubs would be beating a sort of a fast path to, to, to Alex Salmon's door saying, hold on a minute, this is starting to cost us money and we need to look at this again. And I've probably missed more games this season and I have probably in the last 20 mm-hmm. you know, I haven't been to an away game since I think the last away game I was at was a, maybe the Motherwell game before Christmas or, or no perhaps I think maybe the Hearts Cup tie was after that maybe mm. I can't remember the, the, the way the two games came but you know I haven't been in a away game since then and you know it really upsets me because I've just spent my whole life going to the football yeah. but it's just my enemy protest I'm not out there banging the drum saying everybody should support it it's my enemy protest at the moment and and I also should say as well, um, there, there are things going on uh, behind the scenes at Celtic Park as well. There, I was encouraged recently when when the board came out and and made such a you know public statement, you know, opposing the bill and asking for an, a react and an early review yet and stuff like that. But you know, we've really been at them for two years to do that, and it's only now, you know, and you wonder why it's only now. But there's there's a few things going on about behind the scenes. That I'm not entirely happy with, and again, this will be controversial and create a big debate amongst the support. But I think the way the Green Brigade boys have been treated is, a, is an absolute disgrace. Uh, I think sometimes they've been demonised uh, by the press in this country for, you know, just at a time when a mob across the city are on their knees and about to go. You know, every time that they're really struggling and looking to get down the stank again, it seems that somebody throws a bit of dirt at the Green Brigade and gets him in the front page and right. keeps the other people off. And I think some sometimes, you know, the people that are running the club at the moment of I've indulged that to a certain extent and I've been quick to demonise that group as well. And So, you know, I, I'm really in a real dilemma at the moment because I know the season ticket in yours will be hitting my doormat quite soon and, 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 and I'm, no, I'm not sure what I'm doing for next season. And I never ever thought I'd say that. I'm a guy that's had a season ticket again for as long as I can remember and a guy that just goes to all the games and, and I'm conflicted at the moment yeah. <laughs> uh, because of the way things are going in football and... It's just not the same enjoyment in it for me at the moment. I'll always be part of what Celtic car in that community, and I'll always continue to sort of a support the charitable aspect to that and, and the, the Celtic community. But I'm really, really conflicted at the moment about whether or not I'm going to throw my six hundred quid into the pot and you know and, and say, "Well, just carry on as normal, guys." I really think something's going to happen between now and the end of the season to resolve a lot of the sort of a PLC fan issues out there and and. And this will probably generate reams of debate and Twitter and, and stuff like that. But but that's just my opinion. But uh, but no, earliest memories. I've just I, I can't remember a time when I didn't go to Parkhead and uh, and I'm really really conflicted because I'm I'm contemplating a time where I might not go yeah. uh, next season. And, and I hope it doesn't come to that. I hope you know. And I'm not saying it should do something just to suit Eddie Turner, but I'm hoping that there'll be some. Resolution to the, to the difficulties that are there at the moment to, to allow me just to get back to you know supporting the team and enjoying my fit back again. So, right, Eddie, your fourth song. I left school in 1979, just at a time, and I don't even know why to mention her name. It's such a fun program, but it was a time that Margaret Thatcher came to power. And I suppose around about that time is when I started becoming a bit politically aware. You know, started working the civil service and quickly get involved in the sort of trade unions in the civil service. And I made a lot of great friends through that. And there were some people at that time who influenced me as well. But, uh, you know, throughout that sort of, a, you know, from 79 right through the early into the late 80s, you know, in, in the real tough Thatcher years. And, you know, there was what was going on in this country. You know, obviously, you know, sort of 84, you had the miners strike and... You know, just the breakdown of communities all up and down the country, you know, they were being run down, the working class were under the attack. And I'll never forget what she did to the country, and I don't think anybody should. Mm. Uh, and also you had what was going on in Ireland at the time as well, you know, the war had really sort of increased in, in, in the hunger strike in, in, in 1981, and what she allowed to happen there as well was was criminal. Yeah. You know, and and I and I really do hope that you know she's been judged in, in a higher place than she ever would have been in this earth. But for the crimes that she committed against humanity, she should pay a price for that. And but there was, so there was a whole Thatcher years when 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 I was growing up and starting to sort of make my way in the world, if you like. And 
I'll just never forget what she did, and I, and I still think we're paying the price mm-hmm. for Thatcherism. I mean, it was some of the things that are going on in our communities at the moment, and so this song for me defines that period. It's a song where you, I, I think you can really look at it and say, you know, it sums up what Britain was becoming under Thatcher. Uh, so, and it's just a song that's always, any time I hear it, I just think back to the times of. You know, terrible times, and and, and it's the, the, the song is a uh, ghost town uh, by the specials, and you know, serves as a reminder to people that we should never allow people like that to run our country again. Sadly, we're not that far away with, with people like Cameron and Clegg, but uh, there's a whole other political debate there about where we go over the country. But this song, Ghost Town by the Specials, just sums up what Thatcher done to our communities. This town. Irritates you. <laughs> Again, this is another one I've been giving some thought to. I think I've probably arrived at a time in my life where I can be described as a, a grumpy old man. I didn't think I'd ever get here, but this question's made me reflect on that, and I quite clearly have become a grumpy old man because uh, I'm irritated by almost anything at the moment. Uh, I'm irritated by bad manners. And I don't mean the band, I mean actual <laughs> bad manners. <laughs> Wee daft things, you know, you hold the door open for somebody and they walk right through it and they don't say thanks very much. And I feel like slamming it in their curtain, you know. <laughs> you know, things like that, you know, I meditated even in the taxi where people get in and they just sit the whole time on their mobile phone and they don't, you know, there's no please or thank you. Or they issue instructions and they get out and bang. The d- just bad manners, you know, just just things like that. Meditated sometimes when I go you know, maybe at restaurants and stuff like that, and you, know, you sometimes see some of the younger ones, and they, you know, they, they order up and they don't thank the waiter for putting the stuff down and uh, taking their plates away, and uh, just common courtesy and the lack of that at the moment. Aye. I don't know if there's always been a lack of that, maybe with the younger generation. And uh, when I was young, we were told to say please and thank you and acknowledge. We're always told to always treat people the way you would want them to treat you, and I, you know, and I think that's a great mantra for going through life. And uh, I think there's a real lack of that at the moment, uh, and that irritates the hell out of me. What else irritates me? We could really go on all day. There's uh, smoking irritates me. I've never been a smoker, and, and people smoking, and even in my vicinity, you know, irritate me. I don't know if it's because we're now living such a sort of a sanitised sort of social scene where nobody smokes now, and 
you know, the very hint of it sort of really annoys me. And, you know, we can understand why folk would want to sort of fly puff at the game and stuff like that because it gets tense and nervous and stuff like that. But as soon as I get a whiff of that, I get annoyed, you know, because right, it's, it's invading my personal space and I need to smell it and breathe it in and stuff like that. And I feel like I'm shouting, pay a faggot, you know. <laughs> but I don't, I don't because I try and appreciate that that particular person might need that fight to get him to the end of the game as it's gone nuts. <laughs> the Waynes irritate me with their mobile phones, right. you know, and they're constant looking at their mobile phones. And and I hate if you're having, not just with Waynes, but I hate even with adults, if you're having a conversation and they're staring at their phone. And it's almost as if, and to Facebook or tweet, or yeah, it's almost as if they would rather be talking to complete strangers right. than listen to what you've got to say. And, that annoys the life out of me, and, 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 and then when I was thinking about that, I can probably recall times when I've done that as well, you know, and maybe, I, maybe I'm irritating to others, and, and, and I'm going to really try and no do that in the future, <laughs> <laughs> and if I have done it, anybody here take this opportunity to apologise to them, so people throwing litter mm-hmm. annoys me, mm-hmm. I, you know, I recall no long ago being in Shittleson Road and watching this young kid come out of the shop at dinner time you know and they, what a takeaway show it's not that are all packed you know the ways you know being sort of a healthy eaters in the east end we're all <laughs> queued up beside the chippy or buying their rolls and sausage or their boxes of noodles or whatever it is and, but this wee lassie came out of this show and took a roll out of a bag and threw it in the flare and I looked at her and I says going to pick that up and she was about 12 <laughs> and she just looked at me straight in the eye and went fuck off <laughs> It's getting on to debut you. And that more irritated me. <laughs> I think Wayne's now don't appreciate the value of anything either, you know, and, and they get things too easy and and I'm probably starting to sound like my dad had and his dad before that and uh, I really worry about where we're going in the future in terms of how Wayne's are going to converse because it's all done electronically now and it's nobody sits down and has a conversation or can chat with you about things and so I think bad manners, a lack of common courtesy, people not being aware about what they're you know what's going on when about them and the environment and you know the fact that we've all got to live together you know and people who think it's alright just to I mean quite often I'm driving in a taxi you'll see somebody in front of you in a window going down and a whole load of fucking junk will get popped right. out the window and you think and I feel like driving after them and getting in front of them you know like the Sweeney's you know pick it up <laughs> you know it's a disgrace you know so so all of that sort of stuff yeah, yeah. irritates me what really irritates me more than anything at the moment, and again, I have to go back to it, is, is, is going to the football and, and coming up against overzealous stewards in Polis mm-hmm. at the games now. It's almost as if the stewards and the Polis have turned herself into a sort of a wee private army mm-hmm. that's going to attack ordinary football fans going to the match, you know, and it's almost as if they're creating jobs for themselves, you know, where... I mean, I've been to games in the past where there's been, you know, talk about the Leeds United game and over 100,000, but, you know, I've been at Hamden for years and at Celtic Park when there's been 60, 70, 90, uh, thousands. And, and we managed to get to the games without any bother. Right. In and out, relative safety. There was a big, you know, so you had to wait to get in. There was a bit of a crush every now and again. I mean, nobody was ever really seriously injured. And we all get in and people get in with their carry-outs even in the days and, and, and get away again without they're too much trouble. And now we go to the football in these ultra modern stadiums where safety is paramount, and we seem to need more stewards now than ever, yeah. and more polis than we ever had. And that irritates me because why, why is that? What's changed? In fact, things have changed for the better, if you like, in terms of, you know, to use company speak, spectator comfort, you know, and the fans match the experience, you know. <laughs> oh, Statements like that irritate me, you know, you're going to the game with your pals to see the Celtic, you know, it's the match day experience, <laughs> that kind of irritates the life out of me, but, but in terms of the match day experience, things are safer now than they've ever been, Aye. but we seem to need an army of police and an army of stewards to look after us, that irritates me, we now need legislation to govern how we should behave at football, when in actual fact, you know, there hasn't ever really been any serious disorder of football, the last time I can remember there being a real problem, a football game in this country was a 1980 Cup right. final. But all of a sudden, we seem to need legislation to tell us how to behave. Mm-hmm. You know, we seem to have a government in Holyrood, the Scottish government, who seems to want to run what lives for us. You know, not just about football, some of the other legislation we've brought in is it's all about what you can and can't do, you know. Mm-hmm. And so things like that irritate <laughs> take me on a much bigger scale, but 
the biggest irritation I have, <laughs> and this is going to go on all day, and, you know, my, my family, it's common common knowledge at parties or at anything I'm invited to, they say, don't give Eddie a mic, or don't give my dad a mic, because he never shuts up, so I'm afraid you're copping this today, Billy, but uh, the thing that irritates me more than anything now is air travel, and being able to go anywhere on a plane. And how that is almost impossible with the, you know, the security checks and having to weigh your suit. You know, see people stand and putting cases in bathroom scales before they go on their holidays. And I mean, I used to go away when I was younger to Benidorm and Ibiza and Mallorca with all my pals. And you just threw all your clothes in a bag and you threw your carry out in a bag sometimes as well. And popped it onto the carousel and away you went. You went to the bar, you went to the plane. And it was all part of going away and part of the same. Now you've got to think about weighing cases and what can go in your bag and what can he and where your aerosols, where your you know your shaving stuff goes and 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 again that's almost like a, a, like a military manoeuvre now as well, going on holidays and then you get there and you're almost strip searching through the airport, everything comes off your belt, your socks, your you know it's it's just all madness you know and and, and life seems to get more complicated. Mm-hmm. As you get older, I don't know, you know, life seemed a lot simpler when I was younger and we didn't have the amount of technology that we have now and the, the safety procedures in place that we used to. It should be a lot easier now, but it seems to get complicated, it seems to be getting more complicated, so, so I'm, I'm irritated with just about anything in the new Bali, you know, it's just where I'm in my life, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I'm sorry, uh, probably no finish, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Write your fifth song. <laughs> My fifth song, and, and I just touched on it briefly there, I just started going on holiday in the sort of a early 80s, it was a lads abroad sort of a time, you know, when I started to branch out. My first time I ever went abroad, I think it was in 1981, we went, no, I tell a lie, I went to, my first European away game was uh, to Madrid when we played in the Bernabeu in the quarterfinals of the European Cup, but I went by bus to that, uh, First time I ever really went, the first time I was ever on a plane was in 1981, uh, when I went to Benidorm with a big group of my pal, guys I worked with, in the old civil service at the time, and another mate of mine, Tammy Dunnock, who's a big Celtic supporter, yeah, for Easter House, and we went to Benidorm, and that was followed up a few years later with holidays, and we went to Ibiza, and we went to Mallorca, and back to Ibiza, and, and at that time, the sort of a music scene was starting to change, you know, it was going for all the sort of a traditional rock and roll stuff, the sort of a mere dance type of music was being introduced at the time, and... I was sort of thinking back to that period and saying, which song would I really pick for that era that sort of gives me the memories of the holidays? And, you know, and, and, and there was a number of them, you know, the New Order's Blue Monday, there was, you know, a lot of songs for the sort of band aid time as well, because I remember being in Mallorca at the time and that was on. And But this song always stood out for me for a couple of years when we were in I, I Beefle. And I always thought it was a bit odd that it was a song where everybody went up to dance to because mm. it. When when you're listening to the words, uh, you know it's quite a sad song, but but it's you know it sort of builds up into a real sort of a lively sort of a sort of a, and it became a sort of a dancey type song, and and I think suppose looking back as well, it, it became a particularly sad song given that the guy that wrote it committed suicide no long after after he wrote it. But it's a song for me. It just gives me memories of that time when I was going away with all the boys and enjoying the holidays abroad. And it was a song I used to play a lot uh, in the days as well. So the song is uh, by Joy Division, and it's uh, "Love Will Tear Us Apart."
that was Local Terrors Apart by Joy Division. Right. How do you relax? <laughs> How do you relax? This is as bad as a what irritation question. Because I don't <laughs> seem to be able to relax at all at the moment. I sort of almost, I'm like a coiled spring the way I walk about these days. But uh, I used to relax by going to the football. Uh, people have picked up on that. That's no longer a source of relaxation for me. Quite the opposite, in fact. It probably winds me up more than anything does at the moment and, 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 and I would love to get back to just the old days where you went to the football and you had a couple of beers and a few halves into the game or the, you know, the members of your supporters bus we always had a great wee social scene in the supporters bus great sing songs coming back and it wasn't the like songs you know people who know that Dennis and number one will know that they're, they're famed for songs like that big pal who helps to run the bus fame for singing Living Doll you know right, Cliff right. Richard songs we've right. used to people singing Pet Shop Boys songs and people just got up and sung their favourite songs and you know there was a, a lot of the old traditional Celtic songs and it was a great source of relaxation it was you went to the game and you know win, lose or draw you're coming back with a sing song in the bus and you know it was a sense of all being together and, and, and you know a for me at the moment that's missing so so the fit boys out is a source of relaxation but uh, there's a lot of things going on with us in a personal sense at the moment that we don't have a lot of time for relaxation the families are getting big and they, you know and, and they bring their own difficulties is, uh, I like to go wandering I mean I say wandering I don't mean in the hills I mean doing wee pub crawls <laughs> 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 but I, I, I'm at a stage now where I tend to like doing that myself and it could be on a Monday afternoon for instance I mean I work at the weekends now as I say you know as it says earlier being part of the petty bourgeoisie there's not a lot of time after the weekend for me you become self-employed you know your social scene takes you down a different road and I suppose as you get older as well you know you're not as much as you used to be and stuff like that and so I tend to work quite often at the weekends I mean if, if there's some particular we've got on you know as a family do or a, a night out we're asked to then I just go them I'm not a slave to the taxi so I take, I take the nights off but, uh, but because I work quite often at the weekend I've now found myself I like going out on a Monday and I tend to on a Monday just like to go a wee wander and, I start, and because there's no very much others out on a Monday most people are working I, I like to go you know, I, I get my, you know, my partner Jeanette works over at Glasgow University and, 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 and quite often I'll go over and meet Jeanette at the uni and start off there and maybe have a coffee or a wee bite, a bite to eat or something at lunchtime. And then I just go and I do a wee personal pub crawl, you know, and, 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 and I don't mean I don't, I don't go and get bloated, although, although if last Monday was any day, but Jeanette will tell you I did go and get bloated because I did last week, but, but I've developed a phoneness over the last couple of years again for real ales. Uh, so I like to go and find pubs that serve good real ale. So you know, being there in the West End, I'd maybe start at places like like Tenant's Bar, and then and then I, I walk through there and make my way into the town. And you know, and I maybe go down onto Argyll Street into places like the Ben Nevis or along into the Bon Accord. Uh, you know, pubs where it serves decent ales, and and have a wee pint here and a pint there. And and as you'll gather, I'm a guy that likes to talk. So you know, <laughs> I go into the pubs and I'll, you know, and I'll strike up a conversation with strangers that I'll meet folk that I would know or bump into now and again and. And I sort of make my way back towards the other end of the town, back to the righteous side of town, to the east end. So I, I quite often wander through the west end to the east end. I'd stop and half and have a, a wee pint here or a pint there. And, and inevitably, once I hit the east end, I'm bump into people mm. that I know. And it could be in places like the toll booth or, you know, where I again and sometimes meet a couple of pals of mine. Or, or I arrange my, my, my oldest boy, Ed, Edward, he's, he's studying it. Strathclyde unit at the moment and he usually finishes about 3 o'clock on a Monday so I'd maybe meet him maybe have a beer with him uh, he goes up the road and I'll continue my, my, my pub crawl further east finishing up places like the Heel and Jesse and the Gallagher but I like visiting all traditional pubs aye, aye. Heel and Jesse for instance doesn't have a puggy machine or a jukebox or a telly for even it's just a real pub where you can get another bladder and I mean, last week, for the first time in years, I went into the... This is like an advert for the traditional <laughs> pubs of Glasgow, but last week I went there to the, the, the Kingston and went into the Lorison Bar, which is like stepping back into the 1970s. For them, he's been in it. It's an old pub that's still got the old Formica tables and all the old posters up and all the old drink adverts and stuff. And, and it sells really good, really well. And it's, it's just a cracking pub. I just really enjoyed it. People, family run, run with couple of older brothers and I think a sister just a great wee boozer you know and, and, and enjoyed a couple of beers in there so that helps me relax I just like going wandering I like meeting people I like talking to folk and a few pints along the way maybe finish it off with you know a couple of nice malt whiskies and, and then up the road so and, and 
up the road, suitably relaxed <laughs> after that. But, uh, so that, aye, that helps me. I like if we can find the time, you know, me and Jeanette will go to the pictures or something like that sometimes as well and, and chill out a wee bit. And, uh, but we've not had as much time recently today. We get caught up in a lot of the sort of fan-related stuff as well and mm. we really need to try and find some time to maybe try and relax a bit more because we don't seem to be much relaxing in the new bit. Yeah. But that's probably my main source of relaxation at the moment, just staying my wee regular Monday. But they're off at the moment because we're in the middle of Lent, so that... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking forward to them resuming. Although, with an exception, next Monday for St Patrick's Day, Aye, so... Well. <laughs> You're allowed that. <laughs> <laughs> right, your sixth song. My sixth song, again, you know, takes me back to the 80s. The 80s were mad for me, you know. You know, there was a whole load of stuff went on in the 80s politically, as we've touched on, and they weren't the great times uh, for, for, for the working class, if you like. But it was also a time for me when I was growing up. Tons of great mates, but, but music for me was like after you'd been at a night out or been on holiday together, and we would all pile back to somebody's house for a party, and, and songs would get rattled on, and you just, there were certain songs you just needed to play once you'd a wee drink, you, and everybody jumped about there and enjoyed. And, and this song was one, and I had a mate of mine, Jim Delaney, a pal for Coat Bridge, uh, who's still a great friend, and uh, Jim had a wee flat in Bayliston at the time. Uh, and I see a wee flat, you know, if you had half a dozen people in it, that was a mob, but we could pack 20 people in it uh, for parties. But, <laughs> but we quite, we quite often, uh, We'd end up in gym suits after a good night and we would batter on all the tunes. And one of my favourite albums at that time was uh, New Boots and Panties, Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Uh, and just the song that I love playing. And again, because I like that rock and roll sort of a sound. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and it was just a song where you just get into the music and they beat you and, and everything. I just thought it was brilliant. And it just, again, great memories of the days when we were all babied and back in Jim's flat. With, uh, and the song is. Uh, Sweet Jane Vincent by Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Great song. First came me white sailor, the chances were slender, the beauties were brief. Shall I mourn your decline with some thunderbird wine and a black handkerchief? I miss your sad Virginia whisper. I miss the voice that called my heart Sweet Jean Vincent Young and old and gone Sweet Slap John
was Sweet Jean Vincent by Ian Jury and the Blockheads. So, what does the future hold for you? Eh, uh, what does the future hold for me? I'm not sure. Self-employed, working away at the moment, hoping to be able to take my feet off the gas a wee bit. You know, the yeah. plan was is to, you know, bought into the taxi trade a few years ago, really worked hard over the last few years to try and pay all the finance off for, for buying the business and stuff like that. Pretty close to that. Uh, accumulated a fair bit of other debt along the way. But uh, So uh, I'm just looking to sort of like clear the decks in, in terms of that. For kids, you know, my two boys, Edward and Daniel, Edward's at university, quite close to making a serious decision to get off to the seminary and maybe going to study in Rome next year for the priesthood. And, you know, that gives me a lot of pride. And I think that itself might need a bit of support. You know, hopefully he'll need a bit of support and we'll be able to gear that to him as he goes through his studies towards that. My younger boy, Daniel, Daniel's... Should have been at university last year, was offered a place away from home, decided he felt he was too young to go away, so he's reapplied for uni this year, so hopefully he'll be embarking on his university careers quite soon and, and, and I'm hoping to be able to support him through that as much as I possibly can. Two other kids, the age and two kids, my stepkids if you like, Kevin and Sophia. Kevin's just left school now and sort of trying to go out and find his way in, in the world and, and Sophia's still at school. But you know, the immediate future is about seeing the kids up and away and, and hoping that they go off and find their way in the world and be everything they can be and you know and, and try to be there for them just as much as possible with it. One of the things I need to stop trying to do is run their lives for them, you know. <laughs> I need to try and step back for that and you know they need to be allowed to grow up themselves and find their way in the world. But I'm an awful guy for thinking that I can fix things I and mean, then maybe I can here, I can influence that and, and you ask what irritates me, that probably irritates them. But it's just because I care for them and, and I hope that you know, they find their way in the world. I've no expectations that they're all going to be millionaires or, you know, famous. I just want them all to be happy and I want all the ways to grow up and just be as good as they can be and to contribute to the world. And even if it's, you know, I spoke earlier about working class heroes and people who make a real difference to their mm-hmm. communities. And, 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 and I was genuine about it. They are my heroes. Mm-hmm. I think that's what goes on in the book. And I'd like to see my kids sort of a, going off and and being everything they can be and if I can support them doing that, that, that that's the immediate future I'm hoping you know in the not too far far off future that you know they'll be away doing that and that gives us a bit of time then to right. start having time for us again you know and you know and being able to sort of relax a bit more and, and you know find more ways of, of relaxing and seeing a bit of the world and I'd love a time for us you know for myself and Jeanette again just to be yeah, back to well, where's the Celtic playing this weekend? Let's get away for the weekend and, you know, no worry about having to come back for this, that or the next thing. And, or, or they're Celtic playing away in Europe, you know, let's go for three or four days and just do our own thing. And supposing a personal, from a personal point of view, you know, there's where I'd like to see the future going. I'd like to see the kids up and off in the world and finding their way and us then being able to find a bit of time where we can just chill out a wee bit, you know, maybe work a wee bit less. And it probably won't happen, but, <laughs> but that's the plan. Who knows? You know what the future holds for any is, to be honest. But, uh, exactly. but uh, that's what I would like to see happening. You know, uh, you know, terms are politically then like that. You know, it'll be what it's going to be. You know, there's obviously a big debate going on in the country at the moment about Scotland's future, and you know, and I'm all over the place with that. You know, sometimes I'm in the yes camp, sometimes I'm in the no camp. Probably in the yes camp at the moment, and. Depending what happens with that, you know, I don't know whether we'll get dragged into something politically, you know, after that. But you know, I'm the type of person that always wants to take an interest in what's going on when about us, and 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 I keep saying I want to pull back for it all. I've said even for the the fan representation stuff and all that. I'm, I've been trying to sort of a step back, but every time you get to the stage where you're stepping back, something happens and you're dragged back in it again. But I, you know, I would like just to get back to the stage where I can just maybe nobody's involved and hope that there's other people come through and take up the mantle and I always remember years ago going to football when we used to all pack into the terrace and went to any of the away games and there was always a wee pocket of supporters in the main stand that we called at the time we gave for sale supporters and inevitably we're all older people you know quite often guys with shirts and ties and but they all sat there and had their half and their beers and and, and I used to think ah, I can't wait I'm older so I can be part of that you know and that's what I quite want to be now I want to be one of the wee guys it's just maybe a wee bit separate for the main throng but right. But still there as part of it, you know, and, uh, and so maybe be able to take my feet off the gas a wee bit in that regard, you know, and, and just get back to sort of a, just having a, just an ordinary sort of a take life as it comes sort of a existence yeah. rather than, at the moment we tend to react to almost everything, you know, and, and, and it does 
take a lot of time and it sucks a lot of your energy and stuff like that and and, and people don't realise it and that's how I get upset sometimes not just from my own point of view I, mean, I see people like you know Jeanette and, and not just Jeanette other people get a kick in for some of the Celtic support and it's quite vitriolic at times and that saddens me you know mm-hmm. that the Celtic support are so sort of a polarised at the moment you know and yeah. People can be attracted to Celtic for a whole load of different reasons, and we are a broad church, and I think that's all right. You know, in fact, it's one of the things that defines us: the fact mm-hmm. that we're so inclusive. And but people should be allowed to have their thing without running the risk of getting slated for it. And you know, and so we should be allowed to bring, even as a wee political element to it. You know, and people don't like that. So what? You know, mm-hmm. and so I would like this to get to the stage where the future would be that people just see that you know we are that broad church and yeah. and we, we should all be allowed to go to Selic for whatever reason it is it draws us there and that should be recognised and appreciated but, yeah. but it doesn't at the moment for some reason and I don't know what the future holds who knows but I, I would like it to be a more tolerant more understanding future where we can all sort of a, we can all live together and you were talking about Scotland earlier Eddie uh could you give me one thing you would like to see changed in Scotland? I have some concerns at the moment, and I see it quite often in my taxi about uh, about the level of intolerance, uh, and I think it manifests itself in a whole whole load of different ways. I'm concerned about the amount of racism mm-hmm. in Scotland at the moment, you know, and it's no in your face marching in the streets racism, but it's just wee things. And, and I can tell you the number of times I've stopped a taxi and put people out my taxi for them making racist comments, and yeah. you know, and they could be women in their sixties, down to young guys, teenagers, and and it's all about. Oh, all these immigrants and all that, and and it's just the general talk about how you know people refer to you know members of other communities as, and I don't want to say the words you know in air here, but but people know what they are, you know the the p words and the n words and the, you know the black sass and the black sand. The polls seem to get everybody seems to get it, you know, and it's all oh, they're coming here and they're taking all our jobs and they're all getting big hooses and bears den and they're all getting them fully furnished with the government. What a load of shite, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, as somebody who worked in sort of benefits and the welfare rights, I know. I mean, I could tell you horror stories about some of the things, you know, that these, you know, folk who come and, you know, try and find a bit of refuge in this country and what they've got to live with and put all way just to just to get the basics. Yeah. Mm. But there's a perception out there that that doesn't happen. That they're, you know, they're met at the airport and chauffeur driven to a big fancy house and get all the comforts that you know the, the indigenous community have been denied. And mm-hmm. with a load of rubbish, you know. And so I would like to see Scotland becoming much more tolerant and understanding as well. Again, I think like amongst the Celtic support, I think in Scotland, even in the political debate. It's very intolerant and, and can very quickly get nasty and, and very polarised. It's either a, a nose or a dame sort of a thing. And I mean, how can it all be across the board? You know, we, we, we all go to share the country. And I mean, my granny used to say, my God rest her, my granny used to say, we, we all come into this world with nothing and we'll all go out with nothing. Mm-hmm. So we really need to try our best to make the most of it while we're here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would like to think. I'd like to see a Scotland where, where we all made a conscious effort to do in that and all had an understanding of different people's needs and different people's cultures and backgrounds and, and, and could live a shared future, if you like. You know, mm. where, you know, Scotland's a great country. Glasgow's a great city. I love Glasgow. I love showing Glasgow off. But, mm. but there are things that really disturb me about it and one of the things is the level of racism. Yeah, and, you know... Yeah, there's been a couple of prominent cases in the papers and on the telly recently with that documentary in Sucky Old Street where... You know, that really highlighted it for me, but, you know, and, and it was scary. Mm. But it wasn't a surprise to me because I see it and hear it all the time. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I picked a wee woman up in Duke Street no, a couple of weeks ago and she came out of a local news agency and came out and said, oh, they so-and-so's in that shop, there's too many of them. And, you know, and, and I looked at her and said, what are you doing shopping in the shop, hen? You know, and, and she started again, you know, and they're taking their jobs and, and And I just pulled in and said, listen, hen, I, I really don't want you listening to your racism. Would you mind just getting out and... Go on and get another taxi. She went nuts at me, you know. What do you mean? I'm no racist. I says, well, since you've got all you've did, a slag off a guy because he was an Asian. You know, the guy's providing you with a service, a service that you're quite clearly happy to, to use. Right. But you want to criticise the guy for it because he's coloured or because I ah, bet they don't belong here. And I said, well, the guy was probably born here, you know, and, and, and but she just didn't get it. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think that permeates society at the moment and, and it really concerns me. So I'd like to see that change. I think. The multicultural na- nature of Scotland is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I think the new communities bring their own 
their own thing, their own colour, their own vibrancy, mm. their own experiences, and whether it be their wine or their food or, mm. or you know, their music. Or, for me, that enhances Scotland, and there shouldn't be opposition. We should be welcoming and that. It makes yeah. us a much more balanced society. If we could change one thing about that in terms of all, where it really, and again, again, probably going back to the irritation thing, it really annoys the life out of me when I hear people from my community. I regard myself as an Irish Scot. I'm part of the Irish community, born in Scotland, effectively Scottish, if you like, but, mm. but part of the Irish community in Scotland. And I hate listening to people from my community talking about the new immigrants in that style. And you see him, hold on a minute, you know, what did your granddad, your, your great granddad have to put away when he came? They were faced with the same abuse and toler- intolerance. Nah, but we worked when we got here. Folk are coming to this country looking for work, they want to work, they've been denied opportunities, you know. Yeah. We, we should be able to provide them refuge, we should be welcoming them, and, and you know, their skills and whatever. And I could go on all day, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you one story when I worked in a uh, community advice centre, and, and it was at the time of the Gulf War conflict. Uh, I opened up one day and I met an Iraqi woman who was beside herself. And her man had been basically scooped up during the night. Chap at the door, in they came, lifted a man, took him away. Didn't tell him where. For no other reason, he was an Iraqi national. Right. And he was lifted and taken away. And the woman didn't know where to go. She was beside herself. And she came to us and through, again, my colleague Alison and myself, we were able to establish that the guy was eventually taken to Greenock Prison and then transferred to, I think it was Pentonville in London. And it was just because he was an Iraqi national. They were just scooping up all the Iraqi nationals. Now, this was a guy who came to the UK to study. He was studying to be a doctor. PhD educated guy. Studying at Strathclyde Uni. But he came on a visa that meant he had no recourse to British funds. Basically, his maintenance and his fees and all that were all being paid by the Iraqi government, whatever the arrangement was. Uh, so he was living here and studying here, staying in a flat in Sight Hill. The woman was beside herself, left with three young kids. Absolutely nothing. Went to the social security. Can he help her? Mm-hmm. Took us a while to find out that the guy was in jail and where he was, and he wasn't getting released any time soon. Eventually, through charitable donations and people helping out, we were able to get a woman some food. And we went to visit him and stuff like that a couple of times, and we got some money through the social work department at the time to sort of keep him going. But and people would have said he should have just shouldn't have been in the country in the first place. This guy was coming here to make a difference, you know. Mm-hmm. This guy was coming here for an education and yeah. And we'd probably I went back to his own country and used his skills to better people's lives and stuff like that. And and I, I think it's great that you know our country should be able to give, give him that opportunity. Yeah, but but yeah. but people were saying, well, they shouldn't be here and they should be sent to him and they're a threat to the Britain's safety. And this guy's family were completely opposed to the Iraqi regime at the time. Mm. And I think he had a brother killed and. This guy probably at this point couldn't have went him because of his family's activities in Iraq. And he was in jail for quite some time during that uh, conflict. He was eventually released, but again, on the proviso that the British state couldn't look after him, but he couldn't get him. He was working in hotels washing dishes. That's what he was doing, you know, to sit, provide for his family and stuff. Anyway, eventually, all the bureaucracy and all that was settled and he was getting some help for his state and stuff like that and went on with his life. And he invited us up to his house one night for a dinner, you know, and... We went up and we, well, we had a great time, you know, and they really looked after us and, you know, fed, fed, overfed us. But it was one of the things you were, couldn't have ate the amount of food they were putting down there, but you felt you were, might have been disrespectful, so you were shoving grub in. And we had a great night, but some of the stories that that guy could tell us about what happened to him really hot home for me about the level of intolerance there is in this country. And this was a guy, as I say, who was trying to better, he made a difference in the world. Mm-hmm. Guy was quite clearly with skills, mm-hmm. was forced to wash dishes to mm-hmm. keep it feed his family, he was jailed for nothing other than being, you know, a native of a country that we decided to go and invade because of the oil and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, But, but for me, it, it shows the sort of a, a level of intolerance. So I, I would like to, I'd like us all to develop a better understanding of the different sort of our cultures and diversity in the world and, and, and make it a better place for us all. Right, if you had the choice from history to have a beer and a wee chat with somebody... Who would it be? Really, really difficult question. There's been loads of historical figures that you would love to sit down and say, you know, what made you do that and what made you do that? And, uh, I don't know, everybody says Mandela and I would love to have had Mandela as a dinner guest. What a guy, you know, I still can remember, you know, where I was the day. It was one of the moments, you know, the Mandela moment when he, when he came out of jail and stuff right. like that. And I'd love to have met Wolf Tone, uh-huh. you know, in terms of, you know, where he was at that time, uh, you know, pushing for Ireland and, and their identity. and uh, Probably because of the recent history, it would be Mandela. But if there's one person I could bring back in the world to have a beer and a, and a halfway, it would be my old man. 
my dad died young, and and again, as I say, I've got lots of political influence, influences and, and lots of heroes for the past. Uh, that I would like to have asked them this or the next thing, but if I really, really wanted to personalise it and say, is there somebody you could bring back here for a day and go out for a beer with and ask them all the things, it'd be my old man. Excellent answer, Eddie. Right, uh, your favourite cartoon character? Again, okay, I'm thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't going to say that, and in fact, Jeanette, when she did the Desert Island, Tim's probably stole my favourite character because I think she says Calamero. And mine's would have been Calamero as well because he was a wee guy who always proclaimed that everything was an injustice. And and I'd we probably think the same myself and Jeanette in that regard. So I, I used to love Calamero, but quite cruel Calamero for me as well when I was away. Because people, some, for some reason, I've always had a big ball head. Some people describe it as a head like a 30 ball cabbage. <laughs> But uh, when I was young, some other folk used to say that my head was like sort of an egg-shaped head. So people used to call me those cool guys in Easter who used to say, oh, Calamero there, you know. <laughs> so, so I love Wiley E. Coyote right. for, the, for, the, uh, for the roadrunner, just for his sheer persistence and for taking everything that was thrown at him and just getting up and just getting on with it, you know, it's sort of a thing, you know. He did what he could, you know, he stopped the road runner, but, you know, things inevitably blew up in his face. And, <laughs> and he's one of these guys that always set out with a specific target and it always went wrong, you know. Right, right. But he just went moved on, you know, for plan A to plan B to plan C. <laughs> and So I think for his persistent, persistence and his sheer doggedness and refusal to gee up, yeah. I think... Probably Wiley E. Coyote. <laughs> right, uh, your penultimate song. My penultimate song, and again, it's probably getting to be a bit more political now, and, and I think it's quite an appropriate song given the time it is as well. You know, Bobby Sands, we're sitting here on the Monday, Bobby Sands would have been 60 years of age yesterday, you know. When you think back and you think, wow, he would have been 60, you know, I'm 51. It's a guy who was only nine years older than me, and sometimes tend not to think about his age, it's sort of almost right. ageless because of the story but the hunger strike for me was just, you know, an incredible time and, and it summed up a lot about human courage and resilience and the, you know, just sheer determination to know that what you were doing was right and again, you talk about guys you'd like to have met for earlier you know, I'd love to have known what was in Bobby Sands's head when he agreed to embark on that second mm. hunger strike knowing Everybody knew that that was going to be a, mm-hmm. you know, a strike to the end. Mm-hmm. People probably didn't accept that it were going to allow ten guys to to, to, to sacrifice their lives. Uh, but I think there was probably an acceptance when I mean, Bobby Sands set out that for him being the, you know, the first one on that strike, yeah. I think there was only going to be, you know, one conclusion, mm-hmm. and he probably knew that more than anybody. But decided to sort of embark on on the strike anyway and lead yeah. that strike, and, and wow, what a decision, you know, and. But it was much more to Bobby Sands that we don't get to hear about in this country, obviously because, you know, he British censorship in the country we live in. But Bobby Sands was just an incredible man. He was he, he seen himself ultimately as you know, as a soldier and he, but had he not been dragged into that conflict like a lot of young men in Ireland at the time, you know, the opportunities for a guy with his talents mm-hmm. were incredible, you know. When you read some of his writings and his poetry and he produced songs like you know, like Michael Hatton, like Song for Marcella, like Back Home in Derry, and, you know, just fantastic songs, you know, and it made you think more about what that guy was as a human being and the talents he had. It, it disgusts me now that, you know, people in this country are criminalising people for remembering that and singing about that, and, it, and it's just, it breaks your heart. Mm-hmm. You know, it really does break your heart that you have so-called nationalist Republican politicians in this country criminalising people for keeping the memory of Sands and people like that alive. You know, I mentioned three years songs here and I could have picked any of the three of them. Uh, but I think, you know, just a time to reflect, you know, Bobby Sands' 60th birthday and, and a time to reflect on that whole period and, and, and the sacrifices that people did. I'm, I'm going to choose probably the most well-known one, but uh, just to commemorate that period... Uh, it would be uh, the song would be back home in Derry, sung by Christy Moore. Just sums up sums up the talent of the man, I think. In eighteen oh three we sailed out to sea, out from the sweet town of Derry. For Australia bound, if we didn't all drown, the marks of our feathers we carried. In the rusty iron chains we cried for our ways, our good women we left in sorrow. As the main sails unfurled, the curses we heard, and the English and thoughts of tomorrow. 
At the mouth of the foil, bid farewell to the soil, as down below decks we were lying. For Doherty screamed, walking out of a dream, by a vision of bold Robert Dyer. The sun burned cruel as we dished out the gruel, Dan O'Connor was down with a fever. Sixty rebels today, bound for Botany Bay, how many will reach their receiver? To hell as her bow fought the swell, her ship danced her like a moth in the firelight. White horses rode high as the devil passed by, taking souls to Hades by twilight. Five weeks out to sea, we were now forty-three. We buried our comrades each morning. In our own slime, we were lost in the time, endless night without dawn. Slavery, where the climate is raw and the gun makes the law, neither wind nor rain care for bravery. Twenty years have gone by, I've ended my bond, but comrades go so walk behind me. A rebel like him, I'm still the same, and the cold winds of night you will fight. Right, we've come to the part of the programme where I give you the complete works of the dandy and a copy of the Bible to take with you to your island. Would you like a copy of the Bible? Uh, Aye, I would take a copy of the Bible. I mean, I'm very much a practising Catholic. My faith's really important to me. Uh, I'm a Christian, uh, but uh, but, but I see myself as a a practising Catholic and and it's something that really influences me in in a lot of things a day. So I suppose where we hear the Bible uh, as Catholics is by we going to Mass every week and listening to you know the, the the readings and the gospels and, and and stuff like that, and you know, and that's a thing. That, you know, it's been very inf- influential throughout my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and and I think if we can all live our life according to the, you know, and I don't want to be you know sort of a tub thumping preacher here at Enla, but I think if we can all live our lives, you know, around the sort of a teachings of, of, of Jesus and, and and listening to what you know what we says in the Bible. Then we will not go far wrong in the world, and, and and I don't necessarily, you know, I know people can have their own interpretations of that, and and the churches that sometimes as well we need to remember are all human institutions and have their own sort of a fa- you know as all humans do we all have our own failings and we all make mistakes, but but I think my faith underpins what I am as a human being, uh, and you know, and, and it's something that that I'll always have. And of something that I've always encouraged my kids to have, and uh, so I, I would, I would need to take the Bible. Uh, aye. Which other book would you take? Again, I've thought about this question, and, and pff, there are a number of books. I, I'm not a great one for going back and reading books again and again. I like to read, I like to read historical books, but particularly historical books from people who were there as part of that history so I like reading a lot of political biographies and stuff like that and uh, and again I don't want to keep going on about the Irish conflict but uh, I'll, I'll, you know or that particular you know period in you know the, the war in Ireland but I love reading stories for folk who were actually involved in you know you know the war for 69 onwards and, and 
you know, guys who maybe had been in prison and, you know, and how it affected their communities and stuff like that. And uh, I read uh, Lawrence McKeown's book where he did his PhD doing about, about his time in Long Cash and I, and I found that really moving. Uh, I've just recently finished uh, Jerry Kelly's book, The Escape, uh, which talks about the great escape for, for Long Cash. And, and it's, when you talk about a great escape, it should really be made into a film. It's quite a humorous wee book, but, but again, it underlined for me the sacrifices and in, 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 uh, the, what these people did, but also about the talent of mm-hmm. you know, the individuals. You know, a whole generation of people who were drawn into a conflict and locked up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the amount of talent that these people had well, was just incredible. And so books like that always influenced me. Uh, Politically, I used to love reading books like, you know, people like Tony Benn. Mm. Uh, I loved it, reading his stuff. Uh, I think everybody should read The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist at least once uh, for in terms of sort of a defining people's politics. I think every teenager should be made to, mm-hmm. to read that. Catching Their Eyes, another book I think that every teenager should be made to read before they, before they leave school. But... There's one book that I've always meant to read again that I read about 30 years ago, and I've never ever got into doing it. And, and, and only thinking about this question, I'm actually going to now make a point of doing it quite soon. And it was Catch 22. You know, if there's any book that sums up the absurdity of war and, uh, and the military and all of that sort of a stuff, and, and how the big guy gets to shit in the wee guy, you know, all the time, uh, I think it's that book. So for that reason, what I should probably take is the idiot's guide to surviving in a desert <laughs> island because because I'm not very good at you know with my hands and at building things and uh, as anybody that knows me but but I think uh, I think I would like to take Catch Twenty Two and, and read that book again and again I think it's a book that if any kid out there ever speaks to their parents and saying they're thinking about joining the army or to, uh, looking at military life, the parents should immediately tell them to go and read a copy of Catch-22 because I'm sure that'll dissuade them. So I think it would be Catch-22. It's yeah, a great choice. book. Good choice. Right, uh, a luxury. Something to make your life on island a bit more bearable. And remember, it can't be a human being and it can't be a mobile phone. <laughs> OK, so, uh, these are impossible questions. Uh <sighs> I see. I'm, I'm not sure how long I'm going to be in this island. If I thought I was going to get rescued relatively quickly, something that would make my life in Ireland sort of a pass a bit more pleasurably but would probably be a nice case of Buna Harbin or a nice eighteen-year-old malt whiskey or something like that. So I wouldn't mind that. But I'm not sure. For some people, that might not be deemed as a luxury. It probably would for me. I quite like the idea. Of, you know, after my days foraging and trying to build shelter and find source of heat and stuff like that, to be able to pour myself out a nice malt whiskey at the end of that, I think it'd be good. So I'm not sure how much I would need to take in terms of quantity, but I'll, I'll not be greedy and I'll say maybe maybe a nice case of malt. Right, Eddie. Your final song. Uh, my final song is a song that, again, I, you know, it, it just reflects... Sort of had a finality, but a lot of things for me. I hate going to night suit again. I'd say, I always seem to be irritating. The, the, <laughs> things, that, the, things that things that irritate me at the uh-huh. moment are see, see the song Loch Lomond, the Run Rig song. Uh-huh. You know, when you go to parties and stuff like that, and at the end of the night, the DJ always feels compelled to stick that song on, and everybody all gets up into a big huddle and jumps about mad. That song annoys the life out of me. I, 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 don't, I really don't know why. It's probably a good song, and one regular decent band, but for some reason that song annoys And I hate when that, you know, that big it's crescendo at the start, and, and I almost feel like leaving the party at that point. Uh, so... That annoys me, that particular song, and I think this song I'm talking about should would be a much more appropriate song for finishing a good family gathering. Uh, I think we should finish most parties. I had my 50th last year in St Paul's Hall in Shelton, and I finished with two songs. One was You'll Never Walk Alone. I always... See if you're going to have a big huddle at the end of a party, we don't need to be run, Rig. Mm-hmm. Get Jerry and the Pacemakers on and have a big huddle You'll Never Walk Alone. It's much more appropriate for us. Again, I think you got up some DJs that and they're like, oh, I don't know if we can play that. Who are we going to upset? Right. Well, it's my party. I don't care who I'm upsetting, you know. <laughs> so get You'll Never Walk Alone on. Think he's any your run, Rig. So I was going to pick You'll Never Walk Alone for that reason. But this wee song is a song that, you know, see if I've been to a night out or myself or Jeanette, I've been out and we like to go home and put on different songs and we can listen to almost anything. If it, it could be Ruth's T. Wainwright, it, it could be Ray Charles, it could be... We inevitably finish up with the Pogues. Right. And a wee song we love 
having a wee dance in the living room after a good night out and I love finishing a night halfway is this particular song I just think it's a great wee song and it's uh, Rainy Night in Soho my favourite Pog song Eddie Toner thank you very much for being a Desert Island Tim that's been a pleasure but I found it very cathartic <laughs> <laughs> cheers <laughs> I've been loving you a long time down all the years, down all the days And I've cried for all your troubles Smile at your funny little ways We watched our friends grow up together And we saw them as they fell Some of them fell into heaven Some of them fell into hell I took shelter from a shower And I stepped into your arms On a rainy night in Soho The wind was whistling all its charm I sang you all my sorrows You told me all your joys Whatever happened to that old To all those little girls and boys Morning, the ginger lady by my bed, covered in a cloak of silence. I hear you talking in my head. I'm not singing for the future. I'm not dreaming of the past I'm not talking of the first time I never think about the last Now the song is nearly over We may never find out what it means Still there's a lot 